for conservation professionals. And the program is born out of the previous Squam conservation internship as of 2017. Um, the LRCC do a huge laundry list of tasks. They remove invasive species, they maintain trails and access, they educate the public on conservation initiatives, lead volunteers, develop education programs, the list goes on. I think I could probably fill the entire presentation today with everything that we have our LRCC do. But a huge aspect of what they do is act as the faces of the SLA and dramatically increase our capacity. So some of these photos give you kind of an idea on the day and a life of an LRCC member who was serving with us last summer. You may have seen them out trail hosting or lake hosting. Um, they also are out doing trail work during the summers and winters. They do campsite caretaking and of course milfoil removal. Uh, they also have plenty of different education programs. Here is a photo from last year's adventure vacation camp, which happens in the winter and hopefully gives parents of the community a, a brief break during winter break. Um, let's see. So our summer crew, like I said, increases our capacity dramatically. They more than double the size of our regular full-time staff alone and exponentially increase our reach as an organization. Back when we had the internship alone, we only had a crew available to carry out the SLA's conservation work from May to August, which four months is absolutely fantastic. But thanks to the LRCC program, we now have an effective crew stationed here from November through October driving the SLA's conservation work and mission year round. We pretty much only, um, the only time we don't have a crew is roughly a week. Um, so they're constantly assisting the SLA and reaching our mission goals and engaging the public, increasing our reach. During the year, they're the ones who are engaging with people while lake hosting, trail hosting, leading programs, maintaining trails. They're the ones that are out having conversations with the public and talking about the mission of the SLA and the importance of the conservation initiatives that we stand by. Um, and as you can be, see by these photos, they're really out there driving our conservation mission forward, rain or shine, day, sometimes night, pretty much the only thing that'll temporarily keep our crews from going out are thunderstorms and below zero weather in the winter. But other than that, pretty unstoppable. So taking a quick look at 2019 by the numbers, the LRCC's increased capacity ultimately means more time for a lot of different tasks, one of those being terrestrial invasive removal. In 2019, the LRCC improved 29 acres with invasive species re removal. Uh, so to try and contextualize that a little bit, it's hard to grasp what 29 acres looks like exactly. That's over 20, or 20 football fields of land where they relieved native plant species from the pressure of invasives like oriental bittersweet, autumn olive, Japanese barberry, um, among the slew of others that we have in the area. Let's see. Our 2019 crew also spent 618 hours out on the dive boat surveying for and removing variable milfoil from the Squam Lakes and River last year. The success of previous years spent on removal efforts was very evident in 2019. Last year, our crew removed 271 gallons of milfoil in that dive season, where crews in previous years removed gallons by the thousands. Uh, there could be a lot of different factors at play here, including a cold spring and including the fact that with the LRCC program and that increased capacity, we're able to dive well into the fall, sometimes into early October, where like I said, with the SCI program, we only had our crews until July. Um, but essentially, there was significantly less milfoil to be found last year. And for the first time since we began efforts to remove milfoil from the watershed, one of our dive sites previously infested didn't yield a single plant. That was Grapevine Cove, if you know it. So in 2019, we saw some great bounds forward in milfoil removal in the lake. Let's see. Among other tasks, the LRCC also spent well over a thousand crew hours on trail work, covering ultimately over 155 miles, and that is the same as if as if they'd hiked the entire SLA trail work trail network three times over. So they are out there putting in the time and effort for us. I'll go ahead and leave the LRCC's impact 
in education for Leanne to cover after this. So we'll go ahead and move on to the question that I think everyone really wants to know right now, and that is what's happening in 2020? How does the program look in the face of COVID-19? We have certainly had some drawbacks this season on a program wide scale. Our host sites were reduced by half based on some of our sites just not having the capacity to bring on members at the time of our summer program start, which was the end of May, um, kind of at the height of insanity when things were so up in the air. Uh, fortunately at the SLA, we were able to bring on members and that is thanks in part to some help from our community partners. We would not have been able to do it without Sue over at Cottage Place for providing individual quarantine housing for eight of our members for two weeks. And also at Betsy's Park, uh, they are providing our summer cruise long-term housing this season. With their help, we were able to adapt and manage to bring on seven new LRCC members for our summer half-term program. While the start of our summer was filled with plenty of virtual orientations and training and the large amount of tech issues that of course associate with that, uh, we were ultimately still able to get the ball rolling and reach a form of equilibrium with the program. And we've kind of really just hit our stride in the program. It's really exciting to see our members finally get comfortable with all of the tasks that they're assigned and be able to independently handle them by themselves. Um, but many of our LRCC's tasks are still rolling in some form or another. Some look the same as ever with the addition of masks and six feet of distance, of course. Um, but you'll still see our LRCC members out on the trail. Uh, you'll see them trail hosting, you'll see them lake hosting, you'll see them caretaking at our campsites. And then some of our cruise tasks have been adapted to ensure safety of crew and participants. Um, that's the case with education programs and volunteer opportunities, both of which we've just recently rolled out again, um, with, both with lower participant caps in order to ensure distancing is possible um, and no tool, tool sharing and things like that. But all in all, this summer does look relatively close to a normal one with one pretty big exception. Due to COVID, we were unable to get our summer crew their open water dive and weed control dive certification. So I guess the question that is probably on people's minds after that is what that means for milfoil. Like, are we going to lose all of the progress we've made so far? We will soon be having our crews going out to do snorkeling and surveying in order to identify any large problem areas in all of our dive sites. We do have three certified divers on our full-time staff and we'll be going out to tackle identified areas of infestation with what's left of the dive season this year. And with our surveying crew um, doing what they are, we will be able to tackle those large patches this year and next year ultimately hit the ground running so long as we're able and regain any lost ground during the season because of COVID. But overall, the LRCC has been able to continue strong in the face of COVID. We've adapted and evolved as needed in order to keep the mission going strong. Uh, but we will be beginning our recruitment for this winter's crew very soon, within this week actually. It's been a pretty busy week. Um, but I'm exploring new methods of recruitment in order to ensure that we reach a diverse pool of applicants. Uh, we recognize we need to do our part in tackling the injustice and inequality that is very common in the field of conservation and recognize that recruitment is a valuable mechanism of doing so. So we will be rolling that out with our next round of recruitment. So another goal I mentioned of the LRCC program is to help our members develop the skills and experience needed for conservation professionals in order to prepare them to move on into the field of conservation, which you can go so many different directions in the field of conservation. Um, and we all know how hard it can be to get your foot in the door. So essentially the program is meant to be that for our members, um, a way for them to get their foot in the door, gain confidence and experience before they go on to pursue their own careers in conservation. In 2019, across all of our eight host sites, the LRCC program successfully prepared 29 individuals to move on in the field of conservation. So where have the SLA's LRCC members gone after they left the program last year? We have members from 2019 all over the country. Some are doing work for state governments. Others are doing environmental education. Some are leading programs at other organizations. Two of us are actually at the SLA as full-time staff members, both 
in this meeting, one of them being me, um, and the other being Adele, our communications coordinator. He just couldn't quite get rid of us just yet. Uh, we also have program alumni who are committed to graduate programs in biology and marine biology at SUNY Oneona and Northeastern. Um, so that's really exciting. Basically from this page of different places that all of our alums have gone, you can see the range of different directions that you can take. And it also indicates the success of the program as a jumping block to help launch our members into their next directions. Um, where the program covers such a broad array of tasks that we expect from our members, there's really something in it for everybody to take away, regardless of their future career interests. And if you would like to learn more about the LRCC program and also hear from their perspectives, I highly encourage you to visit our new website, the name right up here, lakesregionconservationcorps.org. There you can learn more about the program, about our different host sites, and also get a glimpse into the daily lives of our LRCC crew and read their conservation journals. They get really creative and give insight on what they do, and they talk about what conservation means to them. And we have some absolutely phenomenal writers in our crew this year. So I highly recommend you take a look at what they've got to say. There's a couple samples here at the bottom of what they look like. Um, but we have each of our members do one each week. So there's lots of opportunity to learn more about their perspective. And on that note, we just ask that you save any questions until the end and I'll pass things over to Leanne, our Director of Education, to talk about education in 2019. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Danielle. So hey everybody, I'm Lee Ann. I am the Director of Education at the SLA. And this is my third summer here at the SLA. And I'm just curious to know how many of you who are on the call right now um, have ever attended an SLA education program. So there should be a poll that will pop up on your screen and you can just answer yes or no if you've ever attended one of our education programs. And maybe you virtual counts as well. So if you've watched some of our virtual um, videos that have been posted, uh, let us know. Nice, so it looks like most people who are on the call right now have attended, which is awesome. That makes me very happy. And I hope that you all will um, continue to show up to our programs, whether that's in person or virtual. So over the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna give you an overview of the education programs offered at the Squam Lakes Association. And we'll look at how 2019 compared to previous years. And I'll, um, also chat a little bit about what, um, what these programs are looking like for 2020 and um, beyond. So education program numbers are on the rise, as you can see from this chart, and they continue to grow, actually leaps and bounds. Um, some of this is probably due to data collection. Um, so in 2018 and 2019, I was keeping track of the data, um, but we also have added quite a few different programs. Um, we're offering a lot more based on the interests of our members and the community needs as well. So you can see um, in 2017, we reached 315 people, and in 2019, we reached 2,166 people through a variety of programs for all ages. And these programs included things like guided paddles, which often explore different topics. So aquatic plants, birding, and sometimes they're just a paddle, just to get out on the lake and enjoy a sunrise or a sunset, um, or just to get some exercise and paddle out to Moon or Bowman. We also offer guided hikes and snowshoes, 
which helps connect our members and the general public to the over 50 miles of trails that we maintain. And it, again, it's just a way to connect to nature and soak up the amazing views from the Squam Range and just to, to connect to the watershed. We have a variety of youth programs, which include school programs, after school programs, and then the adventure vacation camps and summer camps, which I'll go into more details on those. We offer the Squam Speaker Series roughly every month, but it just depends um, on how many folks are interested in giving a talk at the SLA. And these explore a variety of conservation, recreation, and scientific topics. And in 2019, they ranged everywhere from nature-inspired poetry to how to, to, to design your, your property, um, your landscaping on your property with green infrastructure as a way to protect the water quality. Um, it ex we explored things like the importance of local agriculture and food production, land conservation, local impacts of climate change, and then quite a few were actually focused on history, which included how we can read the landscape to reveal the local history a presentation was given on New Hampshire boat history, and then Peter Francesco presented his collection of postcards, which offer a really interesting glimpse into the history of the Squam area. We offer adventure ecology programs, which Danielle mentioned a little bit. Um, these are spearheaded by our Lakes Region Conservation Corps members. And so each one of these programs is unique because they bring their own interests and passions to the programs that they're creating. And this evolved from only being held on Fridays during the summer to now we offer them year round. And they include, include things like the guided hikes, guided paddles, and, and even more. And in 2019, there were over 70 programs and the most well attended ones explored topics such as nature card making, fall foliage guided hike to Mount Israel, ecosystem expedition sunset paddle, and a people's history of Squam. And new this year was our nature inspired art program. And these are offered on Sundays throughout the fall and winter. And then in the summer, they're sprinkled in on Fridays. Um, I give the members the option of choosing whatever type of adventure ecology program they want to offer. So some of them decide to offer a nature inspired art. So I believe Maggie led one recently that was very well attended all about nature printing. And so these are an opportunity for folks to connect to nature through the arts. And topics have ranged from sketching, painting, poetry to screen screenwriting, and they all weave in natural history as part of the program. We have partnered with the Squam Lakes Conservation Society and the Squam Lakes Natural Science Center on science pubs, which have been really well attended and they continue to be one of our most well attended programs. Um, with up to 60 people attending some evenings. And so these have been held over at Walters Basin. And in 2019, they took a local focus to the global problem of climate change and scientists shared their perspectives. And then following a brief presentation, usually about 20 to 30 minutes, um, we open the floor up to questions and a discussion. So they're really a fun, informal way to connect um, with community members and then to kind of bridge that um, connection with the scientists who are on the ground doing the research. And the one thing that all of our education programs have in common is that the ultimate goal is to strengthen and deepen the participants connection to the Squam Lakes watershed. And our hope is that they will then want to help preserve this amazing natural resource. And like many of you probably maybe have attended camp or were a counselor at camp, but have somehow been involved with our summer camps. Um, they have been around since 1955. And these have introduced young people to the unique resources in the Squam Lakes region and even beyond. 
So through paddling, hiking, swimming, sailing, and environmental education, our campers develop a strong sense of self, community, and place. The JSLA and community youth sailing programs provide healthy outdoor recreational activities designed to stimulate inquisitive minds, develop lifelong friendships, and create lasting memories. And this year, we unfortunately did cancel camp due to um, obvious health concerns. And we have been able to offer some virtual programs. Um, one of our camp counselors really wanted to um, get some more experience. And so she offered to um, do some virtual campfires. And those have been well attended. And the kiddos who are um, signing on to those love it. There's lots of laughs and storytelling. Um, today, she presented a, a lesson on trees that they can see in their backyards. And while we tend to focus mostly on what our campers get out of the summer, a huge piece of camp is the training and experiences that our environmental leaders and sailing instructors receive. So they're trained in wilderness first aid and CPR. They become certified lifeguards. Some of them get their US sailing small boat level one instructor certification. And we work closely with other camps on the lake like Deerwood and Camp Hale and are sometimes able to bring all of the counselors together to share their camp songs, games, activities, and for them to really just be able to connect to other counselors and share what it takes to be a successful summer camp counselor. Um, and our leaders and instructors all gain experience teaching environmental education, strengthening their leadership skills, learning how to collaborate with team members, and then many of them go on to become educators and even some of them have gone on to become environmental educators. So we'll take a closer look at the community youth sailing program. And every summer it looks a little different each year, just depending on the instructors. But one thing always stays the same and that's by the end of the season, campers are typically able to fully rig and sail the boats on their own. And so it's really neat to see them develop that independence and that confidence to, to take on. And then we're always looking for ways to make camp more exciting for returning campers and to attract new campers. So in 2019, we offered one week of sailing camp that included an overnight camping adventure, which allowed some destination, destination sailing around islands and also for them to experience a night under the stars which some of our sailors had never camped before so that was exciting for them and as you can see from this chart enrollment ebbs and flows through the years but in general each year sailing enrollment comes pretty close to filling all the spots that are offered so the blue are the number of spots available and then the orange line is how many um, folks actually enrolled. And so in 2019, 58 campers experienced the fun of sailing. Our Junior Squam Lakes Association is our oldest and long, longest running education program, which gets the kids outside exploring the watershed, whether it's hiking to a peak overlooking the lake, which can be a huge feat for some of our first year campers, to catching their first brook trout, to many campers' favorite day, which is Squam Olympics, where they compete in a variety of challenges, including sketching a camp counselor, untying a frozen t-shirt, and canoe relay races. And in 2019, Camp Deerwood joined us for the fun. So we, we mixed them, them into the different groups, and they all had a blast. And this is often something the campers say is their favorite day. And a huge piece of JSLA is learning how to canoe and kayak. A lot of time is spent paddling to the islands, learning how to navigate, and of course, swimming and playing tons of games. But we want all of the kids to know how to safely take out their canoes and kayaks and paddle on the lake. And then something new that we added in 2019 was that we offered triple overnights to our oldest campers. And that was a huge success and something that we look forward to offering again. And this, this is the, 
the map that the boys group, the triple overnighters, they tracked their, their trip. And so they did a total of 15.57 miles and they spent 11 hours and 39 minutes paddling on their four days out. And so they spent a night on um, Hogue Island, a night on Moon, and then a night at Chamberlain Reynolds and then returned back to the SLA. So it was challenging for them, but when I asked them if they would all do it again, they all said yes. So I took that as a success. And here's the numbers for JSLA over the years. Um, enrollment's fairly steady. Um, in 2019, we served 192 campers. And then modeled after our much loved JSLA camp, we um, created adventure vacation camps. And those are just really an extension of the summer fun. So we play a lot of the same games. There's riddles all of those fun things that the campers love. And we just put a winter and spring twist on it. And those are offered during our New Hampshire, February and April breaks. So in February, campers learned how to ice fish. They learned what's happening under the ice in winter. They learned how to build snow caves. They even got to go behind the scenes at the Science Center and they learned all about animals winter adaptations. And then in April, the campers explored Chamberlain Reynolds, looking for signs of spring. Spring. They had a visit from the Science Center's animal ambassadors who taught the campers about migration. And they learned all about what a watershed is and ways that they can protect it by becoming watershed warriors. And this is them holding very proudly their certificates and their patches. And I have seen a few of these kiddos afterwards and they actually put their patches on their backpacks, which is pretty awesome. So they're very proud. So I hope that you will join us again or maybe for the first time for an SLA education program to learn more about the watershed, to explore it and to connect with this beautiful place that I'm guessing we all really love. <laughs>